This is Toledo Symphony Lab, a behind-the-scenes look at the world of classical music from WGTE Public Media and your Toledo Symphony. I'm Brett Cresswell. I'm joined today in the studio by the Toledo Symphony's president and CEO, Zach Vassar, also principal second violin and artistic administrator, Merwin Sue. We are masked and sterilized and ready to go because we also have a very special guest joining us today. That is Byron Stripling. He's a jazz trumpeter, a conductor, a vocalist, and he's bringing the Louis Armstrong songbook to the Stranahan Theater this weekend. Welcome. Hello. How you doing? Good to be with you this morning. We're so glad to have you on the program today. Um, I should mention that you're joining us by phone. You're down in the Columbus area, is that right? I'm in the Columbus area, and I do have to also uh, say that I'm a jazz musician, and this is the earliest I've ever had to do anything. (laughs) So I want you to know, I didn't sleep last night in order to make this interview with you. So just please be aware of that. And I'm loaded up on coffee, so let's roll, baby. (laughs) All right, let's do this. Okay, well, you've destroyed the illusion that we are actually doing this live, because we are recording it in the morning. Well, (laughs) it it would be funny to think that getting up for a 3 o'clock broadcast would be... That would fit with the jazz (laughs) rubric, wouldn't it? (laughs) Guys, it still works. It still works. still works, Yeah. yeah. I used to, you know, back in the day when I was in college, I used to say, you know, I'd be up at 9 o'clock in the afternoon sometimes if I had to get up early. (laughs) But, uh, yeah. Well, now, Byron, that you're a little bit fueled up on coffee, uh, I want to ask you maybe to introduce yourself to our listeners. Sometimes when I have guests on, I ask them to tell their story. So in this case, it would be Byron's story. Actually, before I do that, I've got in my notes here that your first name is is actually Lloyd. So it's Lloyd Byron Stripling, right? right? L-L-O-Y-D, yeah. My parents felt that was better than Byron Lloyd. So we (laughs) go with Lloyd Byron Stripling as my official name. (laughs) Is that a family name or where does that come from? Which one, the Stripling? Uh, well, (laughs) (laughs) the the, the Byron or the Lloyd. So my... My parents, you know, they were avid readers and, uh, dare I say, voracious readers. And uh, that's a name that they came upon often, both Lloyd and Byron, in their reading. Um, it, you know, as you begin to ask me to tell my story, certainly I can go to my parents and my upbringing. My, my upbringing was uh, uh, surrounded uh, by music. And my father was a classical singer. He was a, a baritone who sang with the Minnesota Orchestra and the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra. He was also a conductor. And so early in my life, I was surrounded by great sounds. Uh, I, you know, classical music, we went to see Beverly Hills, Marilyn Horn, Leontine Price. I saw the great the soprano Marian Anderson. My parents wow. were really involved in that. And then later in my life, uh, oh, not later, he, at, at the same time, my father also loved jazz. That was his way of relaxing. So I got to see Count Basie and, and Duke Ellington and Sarah Vaughan and Ella Fitzgerald. And later I began to be able to play with some of those people, which was a dream come true. Wow. Then to relax even further, my father would put on Michael Jackson and the Jackson Five, The Temptations, The Four Tops, The OJs, and great music from Motown. Mm. So it sort of had this diverse education musically, but also educationally. This is a period of time when uh, black families always said our way out of the ghetto and our way out of anything is education and that was emphasized in my house education always become better and what we learned is that readers are leaders mm. and so i continuously feed my mind and my brain with good uh, books and that's thanks to the upbringing of a family my, my mother my father uh, felt the importance of education was you know the, on, the, on the top of the list my parents were both teachers so that's kind of a little bit of my story wow that's yeah. fantastic yeah I, I pulled up a little bit of music for you in the background i hope it's all right yeah yeah you you mentioned michael jackson i was a huge uh jackson five fan when i was a kid uh-huh. i remember i used to take the little portable uh, 45 rpm player out on my lawn and plug it into the the yard light switch and play it for the neighborhood to hear and and I had my next door neighbor convinced that I was Jermaine Jackson for a while. Oh, that's um, great. Yeah. I mean, she Wait. was I she wish. was only five, but yeah. I, I figured I Michael would be. That. I figured Michael would be a little too you know ambitious, so I went for Jermaine. <laughs> yeah. Well, had I known you, then I would have. Uh, Helped you pick your afro. And, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You're putting I a. Do have to, I do have to say, you know, in regards to to that period of time, also, television was, you know, important. Now we're in an in internet sort of society. 
So for a, a black person like me, there were Johnny Carson always had on great guests, and mm. so for me to see somebody, whether it was a Flip Wilson on, on the Tonight Show or a Flip Wilson show, or to see any of the great artists that we got to see on television, you know, I was always looking for that, and especially the Tonight Show because that was my chance to see one of my heroes, which was Doc Severinsen, mm-hmm. who's now yeah. a great friend. And so every night I got to see and hear the trumpet. One of the things I think that valuable in education and one of the things that Toledo Symphony does is that if they can get kids into the audience, and I'm certain if they have educational programs, those people will get violins, violas, cellos, and bassoons, and, and, and oboes, and clarinets, and trumpets in their hand. And I, I would love to say that to have that in your hand can be a lifesaver, because when I was a kid, when I stepped into the band room, that changed me totally. It was like the lights were turned on. I wasn't too cool in math and social studies and all that other stuff. But in the band room, I felt I was like at home. Hmm. And that was a place for me. And I, I, I know that the symphony offers the opportunity to hear that great music where some people have this perception that if they haven't heard something, uh, it's, you know, it's not popular, it's not relevant. And what we know that any music that you haven't heard, whether that's Beethoven, Brahms, Mahler, Wagner, or even my favorites like Chopin and Mozart. <laughs> no, but all of those guys. Wagner, he's another one. Uh, yeah. but, 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 you know, if you haven't heard that music, that has a chance to impact you on your life and lift you up and fill your heart with joy. All you got to do is go there with an open heart. And the final thing we know about that is if I can get a trumpet or a saxophone or a violin in somebody's hand, then maybe they won't have a gun in their hand. And maybe they'll live a little bit longer and live with a passion and peace uh, that is inherent in making music, this thing that we deliver to people. William James of Hart said, I sing not because I'm happy, but I'm happy because I sing. And we know that giving somebody a song gives them purpose and hope, and that's what the Toledo Symphony provides for people. I'm just going to sit back and let you talk, Byron, because that was uh, fantastic, really. I, I really was wonderful. just saying, I want that coffee. What, yeah. what, what yeah. coffee, dude? <laughs> that was amazing. Wow. Yeah. Well, it's coffee, but it's imbued with a whole lot of other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we're back now. It's Toledo Symphony Lab, and we're talking today with uh, Byron Stripling, who is bringing jazz to the Stranahan, bringing the Louis Armstrong songbook along with him. Wonderful performance. You can find more information at ToledoSymphony.com. Let me ask you, um, since we're coming out of a a fundraising break, uh, public radio must have some sense of meaning for you and and your life from from what I've garnered. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah, well, certainly. I mean, I think when we we listen to, uh, and it's not to go off on any other kind of station, but a typical radio station, they're actually going with statistics as to what to play people. It's basically like, what is the flavor of the month? What am I going to play that everybody likes or that I can perceive or lean on them? And public radio, NPR, does something uh, totally different. And it's sort of the way that I live my life. Like, it's it's like, what is relevant and what is heartfelt? So if you want to hear classical music, you need to go to NPR. If you want to hear jazz, you need to go to NPR. But the thing is, I've realized quickly, because it's not like a commercialized thing, that I need the person, I need to be the person that drives the success of that. And I can do that through just small donations. And so every time I look at my statement, my wife has yet put another thing on my Visa card that says an additional donation to NPR. And it's not big, but what it is, is it's consistent. Yeah. So it's like $10 a month. And so it's like I don't feel the pain you know, of it so bad. But what I do know is that when I turn on that station and that music comes out, then I'm a part of that. I'm a part of that service that I'm getting essentially for free as I drive in my car. So that's, it's so important to me to, to, to get different perspectives from one that's not driven by commercialism, but it is driven by heart. And the, the above thing, the most important thing to me in my daily life is truth. That is, is driven, driven by truth. And you want to hear the truth? Beethoven, Brahms, Louis Armstrong, Count Dizzy Gillespie. 
nothing but the truth. Wonderful. Well, I want to let uh, the other guys chime in here. Zach, I know you have some stuff that uh, you want to say to Lewis. Uh, to <laughs> Lewis. I'm well. calling you Lewis already. Uh, <laughs> Lloyd Byron. So, Byron, I just want to um, share a memory with you. Uh, so we, we once shared the same uh, space, but uh, we, didn't, we didn't meet. I was, I was living in Boston. It was July of 2001. And at spur of the moment, I just got a ticket to the Boston Pops. And there was this uh-huh. trumpeter playing, and his name was Byron what? Stripling. Was he cute? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> let's just say I had tickets very far from the stage. I couldn't tell. <laughs> That's, but that's man, no could he no. play the, tr- the, the trombone, the, the trumpet? Couldn't he play? It was just one of the most remarkable performances that I've ever seen. I remember talking about it for weeks, and it's going to be just a privilege to see you on the stage here this weekend. I'm glad it was the same guy, right? <laughs> <laughs> By- Byron, you, you, you have played the Boston Pops, right? I'm not yeah. thinking of the wrong guy, right? <laughs> right. I've probably played the, the Boston Pops probably 20 plus times. Yeah, yeah fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's great. My first time, I must say, was with in 1987 with John Williams, his mm-hmm. conductor, and mm-hmm. I did a little tour with him in a t- and the TV show, and then I've done it uh, many other times since then with uh, Keith, Keith Lockhart, who's a friend. So it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, it, I mean, if we were to go through the list of people you've collaborated with and, and the big bands, you know, from all these fantastic, famous names, you mentioned, you know, Dizzy Gillespie, the, the Woody Herman, Lionel Hampton, Louis Belson, I um, mean, the list goes on and on and on. Um, you mentioned before we got on the radio that Woody Herman had a nickname for you. Yeah, he always called me Lord Byron. You know, essentially... <laughs> He, everybody got a nickname, and it's sort of a jazz musician thing too. It's like the, the moment you 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 get. I mean, I've been called many many things. I'm you know people call me Byron Stripling, but all the old guys used to call me Boring Sibling. Uh. No. <laughs> <laughs> wow. My other friends used to call me Byron. Get one free. I mean, this, 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 this list is. <laughs> Hang on, I'm writing these down. You got That's any right. more? Yeah. <laughs> I got tons more, but they're boring after that, and most of them are vulgar. So, right. <laughs> well, while I'm we're respecting, I'm respecting NPR. Yeah, while we're on the subject of names, uh, maybe you can clear up this discrepancy that I hear sometimes for me. We're talking about Louis Armstrong. But I also hear it pronounced Louis Armstrong, and I play some of his music on the radio, even during the the classical hours. Mm-hmm. And uh, I always feel like I'm tossing the coin in the air, you know, depending on how I'm going to pronounce it. Uh, how do you say it? How should it be said? Uh, you know, I actually, and I don't mean to be to, to be weird with your question. I actually don't think it matters. That's number one. I think what does matter is that we say it in any way we want to. So yeah. we can say Louis Armstrong, we can say Louis Armstrong, we can say Satchmo, uh, we can say Pops. These are, again, it's a jazz musician thing. Like, a nickname is something that personalizes it for you, and I think the most important thing is that music comes into your heart. When we think about Louis Armstrong, here's, here's the guy who came from the poverty of the streets of New Orleans and went on to become an ambassador of jazz for mm-hmm. our country. That's what we need to have in our heart, realizing that it, it's really the American dream, that you can come for, from anything. From, from poverty even, and go on to play for kings and ki- queens and be the representative of uh, throughout the world of what jazz is about, which is really it's about democracy, being able to do your own thing your own way. Before Louis Armstrong began to sing, everybody sang like, Don Giovanni. And wow. Said, Right, so a whole different concept. And if you sing like the choir, say you sit in the back of the choir. But Louis Armstrong took his unique gifts and talents and stood center stage in composing his life, which is what we're all trying to do is compose life, and he sang his song. And so the question is, he found it. He found revel- relevance to his life through his God-given gifts, and he was able to exploit what many would have seen as faults. Mm-hmm. But he took that. And it's also an African-American tradition. When, when you hear Mahalia Jackson sing, the great gospel singer, she stomps her feet, she claps her hands, she moans, and she grunts. Right? This is not a European concept of 
communicating, but it becomes the defining way that we deliver music as we stand here in this in 2020, is that all of these influences, largely from African-American culture, have embedded themselves within the culture. So people want to have Afros now when black people used to straighten their hair back in the day. People want to sing and rap and do all of these things. And those things come from these little guys like Louis Armstrong, who have these unique gifts and talents, and they give them to the world. That's the blessing of music, and that's the blessing that within Louis Armstrong, we can see a piece of ourselves, that we have unique gifts and talents. And so that's that's the most important thing to remember about Louis Armstrong. Just say his name. Say Louis, say Louis, say Satchmo, say Pass, and realize that he's a part of America and a part of us. Well, you know, and I think about his music, and it's it's interesting because you know he had such an important role to play um, across really the development of um, you know home consumed music, whether it's on the radio, on seventy eights, on LPs. I mean, and then you think about the the all the different points at which he was an icon. I mean, he you go back to the Hot Fives and Sevens, you go mm-hmm. through um, you know his <laughs> Hello Dolly. And then yep. you know, we also forget that despite all of the amazing music he played, all the work he did with Ella Fitzgerald, then, I mean, yep. What a Wonderful World ends up being kind of his his crowning achievement uh, later in yep. his career. Which was, which became a hit after his death. Oh, wow. I didn't yeah. know that. I mean, he passes away. He recorded the song. It was kind of a hit. And then Robin Williams and the company put it in uh, Good Morning Vietnam. Vietnam. Yeah. And then yeah. it becomes a hit in his death. Yeah. So this is the power of art, and it's something that we need to, in regard to classical music and all that, keep rem- reminding everybody is this music is always there. We just need to go grab it and get a hold of it and open our hearts and let it lift us up. Let it, let it fill us with joy and happiness, because that's what music is for. <laughs> that's what, during this quarantine, how could we live without music? You know, we, we're already already absent the social aspect of being to sit in the concert hall and have our elbows rub, rub up next to somebody mm-hmm. who we might not even know. Yeah. Every time you go to a concert, there's a shared human experience that only those people in that theater feel. Mm-hmm. The music of all the concerts that has been that have been played in that theater are still swirling around there, and we get to experience a special moment in that concert hall with that orchestra. And this always the Toledo Symphony, right? And that's what's going to happen when I perform with them. Is we can have a special moment and this ability, but we have the ability through broadcast and recordings to always have that music with us. So I, I suggest everybody soundtrack their lives. Let your music be your volume. Let it be your gin and tonic. Let it be your mm-hmm. scotch and soda. You can have those things, but you don't have to be addicted to anything but great music, and it will inspire and uplift your life. Wonderful. Well, Byron, I know that you're pressed for time today, but uh, I want to thank you yeah, so much. Yeah, I have to go get some gin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Switching from coffee to gin. Just remember that a little gin ain't no sin. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Byron Stripling is coming to Toledo. He's bringing the Louis Armstrong songbook with him. That's going to be at the Stranahan Theater this weekend, and we're going to have that available uh, for you online as well. Is that one of the streaming concerts? Yeah, that the Toledo Symphony is offering. So you can find out all about it at ToledoSymphony.com. And uh, Byron, thanks again for joining us here on Toledo Symphony Lab. Thanks so much for having me. All the best to you guys. Can't wait to see you in Toledo. And we're back with Toledo Symphony Lab. Uh, We've been talking today with Byron Stripling, who is coming to the Stranahan this weekend. But Byron has had to leave us. He's got a busy day. So we're going to forge ahead now, talking a little bit more about Louis slash Louis Armstrong. I guess I can say either way. Uh, How about this, Zach? I'll say Louis. You say Louis. I say tomato. You say tomato. Exactly. Satchmo rhymes with tomato. Hello. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> okay, maybe in Canada. Okay. Uh, Zach, I know you had something you wanted to tell us about, an experience you wanted to share. Well, besides having seen Byron Stripling perform before, which is one of the more memorable things that I've 
encountered in my life. I, you know, I think about these um, these great videos that we get to see of Louis Armstrong performing, and you know, he was just captivating. And even in those early days of of concert recordings, it's just incredible to watch him play. There's a a great performance that I would encourage everybody to go find on YouTube. If you're if you're near a computer or a phone or something that connects to the internet, look this up right now. It's a it's a performance with Louis Armstrong, his All Stars, the New York Philharmonic, and Leonard Bernstein is conducting. I think it's from the late '50s, and it's a black and white video. And the concert is incredible, but the most am- amazing thing is that W.C. Handy is in the audience, and wow. he's he's very old. He's very close to death at this, and the camera keeps going back to him, and you, you don't even quite recognize who it is until they start playing St. Louis Blues, Right, and he starts wiping tears from his eyes, mm-hmm. and the the passion on the stage, I always talk about this reciprocal relationship between the stage and the audience, is that everybody in the audience feeds off of what's happening on stage and vice versa. It's one of those videos that captures that. And um, it, 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 you know, there, it was a huge performance with thousands of people, but it felt intimate. And, Fantastic. And, and yeah. all that comes through, you know, 60 some years later. Yeah, I'm gonna run to YouTube right, right as soon as we're done. Let's finish the show first, yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, speaking of finishing the show, I do, I do have, I do have the quiz that I promised, the Louis Armstrong quiz, and, and Byron did answer a few of these questions already, uh, without even, you know. I'll still get them wrong. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll find out. <laughs> we'll find out. Uh, let me pull up a little quiz music for us. Set the mood for us, a little New Orleans jazz, right? I feel smarter already for this quiz. Yeah. So I've got a bunch of questions here, but I'm throwing out the first half. Uh, and the second what half... What was wrong with the first half? Well, the first half was a little a little bit of a downer, right? <laughs> I mean, it talks about Louis Armstrong's growing up and all the adversity that he faced sure. and, and that sort of thing. But I mean, I feel like Byron filled in all the blanks for us. He, he really painted this incredible picture sure. of the legacy right. of Louis Armstrong, which he brings to his performances. You know, I, I, I just thinking about you saying that about his, his upbringing, you know, do you remember the Ken Burns jazz uh, series? A phenomenal thing that everybody should probably watch every six or eight years. Uh, the, the amount of time he dwelled on Louis Armstrong was, uh, I think, an entire episode or two, which is probably appropriate. Um, but going into his childhood and his upbringing and how far he came from these enormous obstacles and setbacks, it was really amazing to, to understand the, the, the background of his life, a uh, life that many people would never expect to lead to stardom. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's, it's absolutely worth a watch. Wonderful. Well, I'm going to start with an easy question, and we'll see if you remember this from our conversation. The song What a Wonderful World did not start getting popular until it appeared in what program? Was it TV's The Muppet Show, which featured Rolf the dog singing to a puppy in the 1970s? Was it BBC Radio's The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, (laughs) which was, I believe, from the 1980s? Or was it... Good Morning Vietnam, the Robin Williams movie, set in 1965, by the way, two years before the song was actually recorded. So a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of a time dilation there. Well, if if you're paying attention, you heard him say the Good Morning Vietnam. I had no idea. I I remember that soundtrack. Yeah, Good Morning Vietnam. We actually had that on an LP, and I loved it because they had uh, all of the little radio cuts from um, uh, Robin Williams. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, very comedic uh, uh, moments on the radio, but uh, interspersed between the songs. It was just yeah. great. It's so funny because when you were talking about Rolf the dog singing to the puppy, I I sing What a Wonderful World to Matthias when I put him to sleep. Yeah. Really? So, so yeah. you're playing the, those respective roles? Yeah. You're Rolf and uh, well, Matthias not, is not a little so puppy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm can, trying to envision you as a Rolf right now. Can we it's hear your... Your Louis Armstrong? Oh no, I don't try to do the voice. I try to I, when we play it in a quartet version. Yeah. I'm always doing it at the end. I'm doing that way up in the G string to kind of get a gravelly sound. Yeah, but yeah. you know, that's the extent that I'll try to catch yeah. capture that sound. That, yeah, uh, bes- behind the scenes, look at classical music, ladies Gosh, and gentlemen. In, in, in speaking of that, didn't Byron do a great Louis Armstrong well, impression? Absolutely. Yeah. He just gave us a little tease I there. Just, I, when respect. he he did that, I just. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
You got a couple of uh, questions Sorry, yeah, I'm, for I'm you. just, I'm, I'm vamping here. Go, go, go. Going back to What a Wonderful World, that song came out in the late 60s originally. It only sold a 1,000 copies in the U.S. Wow. But uh, during that release, it became a number one hit in which country? Was it the U.K., was it Switzerland, or was it Germany? U.K. or Germany? Well, so take I'm going a pick. Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say Germany. I'll say UK. Yeah, in the UK. It was the biggest selling single of 1968. Mm -hmm. And it also made Louis Armstrong the oldest musician to reach number one until he was beaten out 40 years later. By whom? By which English artist finally supplanted Louis Armstrong as the oldest musical artist ever to reach number one on the charts? Paul Paul McCartney. Well, he's on my list. Th- yeah. Don't forget, it's a multiple choice. So oh, you've, got, oh. you've got Paul McCartney. <laughs> I thought you were just asking you've a polite got, question here. This is part of the quiz. You've got Paul McCartney, you've got Keith Emerson, or you've got Tom Jones, one of those three. I think we both got... Yeah, I'd say Paul got, McCartney. Got, got, oh, man. No, not Paul McCartney. I think you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's the first time you've ever tried that <laughs> Tried that strategy. Yeah, this is the uh, Burt Reynolds, that's your opinion. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It, it was actually Tom Jones. Seriously? Yeah. For uh, Remember Comic Relief back in 2009? Yeah. He yeah. recorded a BG song for that, and it reached number one. And so he, he managed to unseat Louis Armstrong. Gosh, uh, I, I feel category. like that's not the one that should do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, on, on the other hand, the song Hello, Dolly became an instant hit in the U.S., knocking who out of the number one position after... They were there for some 14 wor- weeks. Was it Frank Sinatra? Was it the Beatles or was it Elvis? I think it was Elvis. <laughs> okay, I'll go with the Beatles. <laughs> Man. Yeah, the Beatles. I feel like I'm taking standardized tests again. I can always get it down <laughs> to two, but I never chose the right one. Yeah. It was the Beatles. Knock the Beatles out of the number one spot. Can't Buy Me Love happened to be the, the number oh, one wow. song at the time. But the Beatles had stayed at number one for all these different songs, all their big hits, you know, they were in their heyday. Along comes Louis Armstrong with Hello, Dolly, and it's, you know, Goodbye, Beatles. <laughs> so, so so Dolly beat out uh, Can't Buy Me Love? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Did you Is do there... the entire episode just to lead up to that? Line? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Hello, Dolly, Can't Buy Me Love. Speaking yeah. of alternative <laughs> titles for Hello, Dolly, <laughs> this is your final question. Which one... Bonjour, Dolly. Of the, yes. <laughs> which was which was which was the that was uh, D A L I, just so everybody yeah. knew. Yeah, <laughs> Dolly, Salvador Dolly. <laughs> Bonjour, Dolly. Okay, <laughs> what was one of the original titles of Hello, Dolly, the musical? They had a few different uh, titles that they they played with. Um, which one of these was in that category? Was it a day well spent? Was it a damned exasperating woman? <laughs> or or was it Farewell Dolly? Which of those three was one of the original titles? Knowing you and how you write quizzes, the answer is probably all the above, but I don't like C. So I would say A, a day will spend. I'd say B. Yay! <laughs> yeah. Dolly, a damned expa- exasperating Seriously? woman. <laughs> yeah. And after Hello Dolly became a hit, then they, they changed it. Change the title of it. A Day Will Spend is actually the name of the play that inspired the musical. So, so, so I wasn't wrong. No, you, well, I mean, that was the original, original title, but it had nothing to do with the musical per se. How does that fit in a marquee? What's that? A damn exasperating one? That's like a really, really that is. long Well, but yeah. remember, at that time, that marquees were very large. Yeah. And, they, and they would often have like five movies on them. So, you know, the print would get smaller. Maybe but somebody maybe... came up with that, and that's why they changed it. They were like, it's not going to fit on the marquee. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's about all the time that we have for our episode today. Uh, thanks go out to our phone guest earlier today, Byron Stripling, wonderful trumpeter, conductor, and singer, who is bringing the songs, the experience of Louis Armstrong to the Stranahan Theater this weekend. More information at ToledoSymphony.com. This program is a production of WGTE Public Media in collaboration with our sponsor, the Toledo Symphony, with generous support from the Rita Barber Kern Foundation. You can download episodes of this program as a podcast by going to our website at wgte.org lab. 
You can also subscribe to us through your podcast app of choice, including Apple and Google Podcasts. And don't forget to check out all the upcoming events at the Symphony. That's online at their website, ToledoSymphony.com. You can also keep up to date with their various social media outlets, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And you can find the TSO's streaming concerts online at stream.artstoledo.com. Special thanks to Zach Vassar, Merwin Sue, and again to Byron Stripling for joining us today. I'm Brad Cresswell, and you've been listening to Toledo Symphony Lab from FM 91.